The Chessmen of Mars. Chapter 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Chessmen of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 10. Entrapped. Turan the Panthan approached the strange city under cover of the darkness. He entertained little hope of finding either food or water outside the wall, but he would try and then, if he failed, he would attempt to make his way into the city, for Tara of Helium must have sustenance and have it soon. He saw that the walls were poorly sentineled, but they were sufficiently high to render an attempt to scale them foredoomed to failure. Taking advantage of underbrush and trees, Turan managed to reach the base of the wall without detection. Silently he moved north past the gateway which was closed by a massive gate which effectively barred even the slightest glimpse within the city beyond. It was Turan's hope to find upon the north side of the city, away from the hills, a level plain where grew the crops of the inhabitants, and here too water from their irrigating system. But though he traveled far along that seemingly interminable wall, he found no fields nor any water. He searched also for some means of ingress to the city, yet here, too, failure was his only reward. And now, as he went, keen eyes watched him from above, and a silent stalker kept pace with him for a time upon the summit of the wall. But presently the shadower descended to the pavement within and hurrying swiftly raced ahead of the stranger without. He came presently to a small gate beside which was a low building, and before the doorway of the building a warrior standing guard. He spoke a few quick words to the warrior, and then entered the building only to return almost immediately to the street, followed by fully forty warriors. Cautiously opening the gate, the fellow peered carefully along the wall upon the outside in the direction from which he had come. Evidently satisfied, he issued a few words of instructions to those behind him, whereupon half the warriors followed the man stealthily through the gateway where they crouched low among the shrubbery in a half-circle just north of the gateway, which they had left open. Here they waited in utter silence nor had they longed to wait before Turan the Panthan came cautiously along the base of the wall. To the very gate he came, and when he found it, and that it was open, he paused for a moment, listening. Then he approached, and looked within. Assured that there was none within sight to apprehend him, he stepped through the gateway into the city. He found himself in a narrow street that paralleled the wall. Upon the opposite side rose buildings of an architecture unknown to him, yet strangely beautiful. While the buildings were packed closely together, there seemed to be no two alike, and their fronts were all shapes and heights and of many hues. The skyline was broken by spire and dome and minaret and tall slender towers, while the walls supported many a balcony, and in the soft light of Chloros, the farther moon, now low in the west, he saw to his surprise and consternation the figures of people upon the balconies. Directly opposite him were two women and a man. They sat leaning upon the rail of the balcony looking, apparently, directly at him, but if they saw him they gave no sign. Turan hesitated a moment in the face of almost certain discovery, and then, assured that they must take him for one of their own, he moved boldly into the avenue. Having no idea of the direction in which he might best hope to find what he sought, and not wishing to arouse suspicion by further hesitation, he turned to the left and stepped briskly along the pavement with the intention of placing himself as quickly as possible beyond the observation of those nocturnal watchers. He knew that the night must be far spent, and so he could not but wonder why people should sit upon their balconies when they should have been asleep among their silks and furs. At first he had thought them the late guests of some convivial host, but the windows behind them were shrouded in darkness, and utter quiet prevailed, 
quite upsetting such a theory. And as he proceeded he passed many another group sitting silently upon other balconies. They paid no attention to him, seeming not even to note his passing. Some leaned with a single elbow upon the rail, their chins resting in their palms. Others leaned upon both arms across the balcony, looking down into the street, while several that he saw held musical instruments in their hands, but their fingers moved not upon the strings. And then Turan came to a point where the avenue turned to the right, to skirt a building that jutted from the inside of the city wall, and as he rounded the corner he came full upon two warriors standing upon either side of the entrance to a building upon his right. It was impossible for them not to be aware of his presence, yet neither moved nor gave other evidence that they had seen him. He stood there waiting, his hand upon the hilt of his longsword, but they neither challenged nor halted him. Could it be that these also thought him to be one of their own kind? Indeed upon no other grounds could he explain their inaction. As Turan had passed through the gateway into the city and taken his unhindered way along the avenue, twenty warriors had entered the city and closed the gate behind them, and then one had taken to the wall and followed along its summit in the rear of Turan, and another had followed him along the avenue, while the third had crossed the street and entered one of the buildings upon the opposite side. The balance of them, with the exception of a single sentinel beside the gate, had re-entered the building from which they had been summoned. They were well built, strapping, painted fellows, their naked figures covered now by gorgeous robes against the chill of night. As they spoke of the stranger they laughed at the ease with which they had tricked him, and were still laughing as they threw themselves upon their sleeping silks and furs to resume their broken slumber. It was evident that they constituted a guard detailed for the gate beside which they slept, and it was equally evident that the gates were guarded and the city watched much more carefully than Turan had believed. Chagrined indeed had been the Jed of Gathol had he dreamed that he was being so neatly tricked. As Turan proceeded along the avenue he passed other sentries beside other doors, but now he gave them small heed, since they neither challenged nor otherwise outwardly noted his passing. But while at nearly every turn of the erratic avenue he passed one or more of these silent sentinels, he could not guess that he had passed one of them many times, and that his every move was watched by silent, clever stalkers. Scarce had he passed a certain one of these rigid guardsmen before the fellow awoke to sudden life, bounded across the avenue, entered a narrow opening in the outer wall where he swiftly followed a corridor built within the wall itself until presently he emerged a little distance ahead of Turan, where he assumed the stiff and silent attitude of a soldier upon guard. Nor did Turan know that a second followed in the shadows of the buildings behind him, nor of the third who hastened ahead of him upon some urgent mission. And so the panthon moved through the silent streets of the strange city in search of food and drink for the woman he loved. Men and women looked down upon him from shadowy balconies, but spoke not, and sentinels saw him pass and did not challenge. Presently, from along the avenue before him, came the familiar sound of clanking accoutrements, the herald of marching warriors, and almost simultaneously he saw upon his right an open doorway dimly lighted from within. It was the only available place where he might seek to hide from the approaching company, and while he had passed several centuries unquestioned he could scarce hope to escape scrutiny and questioning from a patrol, as he naturally assumed this body of men to be. Inside the doorway he discovered a passage turning abruptly to the right and almost immediately thereafter to the left. There was none in sight within, and so he stepped cautiously around the second term, the more effectually to be hidden from the street. Before him stretched a long corridor, dimly lighted like the entrance. Waiting there he heard the party approach the building 
he heard someone at the entrance to his hiding place, and then he heard the door past which he had come slam to. He laid his hand upon his sword, expecting momentarily to hear footsteps approaching along the corridor, but none came. He approached the turn and looked around it. The corridor was empty to the closed door. Whoever had closed it had remained upon the outside. Turan waited, listening. He heard no sound. Then he advanced to the door and placed an ear against it. All was silence in the street beyond. A sudden draft must have closed the door, or perhaps it was the duty of the patrol to see to such things. It was immaterial. They had evidently passed on, and now he would return to the street and continue upon his way. Somewhere there would be a public fountain where he could obtain water, and the chance of food lay in the strings of dried vegetables and meat which hung before the doorways of nearly every Barsoomian home of the poorer classes that he had ever seen. It was this district he was seeking, and it was for this reason his search had led him away from the main gate of the city, which he knew would not be located in a poor district. He attempted to open the door, only to find that it resisted his every effort. It was locked upon the outside. Here indeed was a sorry contretemps. Turan the panthon scratched his head. Fortune frowns upon me, he murmured, but beyond the door fate in the form of a painted warrior, stood smiling. Neatly had he tricked the unwary stranger. The lighted doorway, the marching patrol, these had been planned and timed to a nicety by the third warrior who had sped ahead of Turan along another avenue, and the stranger had done precisely what the fellow had thought he would do. No wonder, then, that he smiled. This exit barred to him Turan turned back into the corridor. He followed it cautiously and silently. Occasionally there was a door on one side or the other. These he tried only to find each securely locked. The corridor wound more erratically the farther he advanced. A locked door barred his way at its end, but a door upon his right opened and he stepped into a dimly lighted chamber, about the walls of which were three other doors each of which he tried in turn. Two were locked. The other opened upon a runway leading downward. It was spiral, and he could see no farther than the first turn. A door in the corridor he had quitted opened after he had passed, and the third warrior stepped out and followed after him. A faint smile still lingered upon the fellow's grim lips. Turan drew his short sword and cautiously descended. At the bottom was a short corridor with a closed door at the end. He approached the single heavy panel and listened. No sound came to him from beyond the mysterious portal. Gently he tried the door, which swung easily toward him at his touch. Before him was a low-sealed chamber with a dirt floor. Set in its walls were several other doors, and all were closed. As Turan stepped cautiously within, the third warrior descended the spiral runway behind him. The panthon crossed the room quickly and tried a door. It was locked. He heard a muffled click behind him and turned about with ready sword. He was alone, but the door through which he had entered was closed. It was the click of its lock that he heard. With a bound he crossed the room and attempted to open it, but to no avail. No longer did he seek silence for he knew now that the thing had gone beyond the sphere of chance. He threw his weight against the wooden panel, but the thick skeel of which it was constructed would have withstood a battering ram. From beyond came a low laugh. Rapidly Turan examined each of the other doors. They were all locked. A glance about the chamber revealed a wooden table and a bench. Set in the walls were several heavy rings to which rusty chains were attached, all too significant of the purpose to which the room was dedicated. In the dirt floor near the wall were two or three holes resembling the mouths of burrows, doubtless the habitat of the giant Martian rat. 
He had observed this much when suddenly the dim light was extinguished, leaving him in darkness, utter and complete. Turan, groping about, sought the table and the bench. Placing the latter against the wall, he drew the table in front of him and sat down upon the bench, his long sword gripped in readiness before him. At least they should fight before they took him. For some time he sat there waiting for he knew not what. No sound penetrated to his subterranean dungeon. He slowly revolved in his mind the incidents of the one evening, the open unguarded gate, the lighted doorway, the only one he had seen thus open and lighted along the avenue he had followed, the advance of the warriors at precisely the moment that he could find no other avenue of escape or concealment, the corridors and chambers that led past many locked doors to this underground prison leaving no other path for him to pursue. Be my first ancestor, he swore, but it was simple, and I a simpleton. They tricked me neatly and have taken me without exposing themselves to a scratch. But for what purpose? He wished that he might answer that question, and then his thoughts turned to the girl waiting there on the hill beyond the city for him, and he would never come. He knew the ways of the more savage peoples of Barsoom. No, he would never come, now. He had disobeyed her. He smiled at the sweet recollection of those words of command that had fallen from her dear lips. He had disobeyed her, and now he had lost the reward. But what of her? What now would be her fate, starving before a hostile city? with only an inhuman caldane for company. Another thought, a horrid thought, obtruded itself upon him. She had told him of the hideous sights she had witnessed in the burrows of caldanes, and he knew that they ate human flesh. Ghek was starving. Should he eat his rykor he would be helpless. But there was sustenance there for them both, for the rykor and the caldane. Turan cursed himself for a fool. Why had he left her? Far better to have remained and died with her, ready always to protect her, than to have left her at the mercy of the hideous Bantumian. Now Turan detected a heavy odor in the air. It oppressed him with a feeling of drowsiness. He would have risen to fight off the creepy lethargy, but his legs seemed weak, so that he sank again to the bench. Presently his sword slipped from his fingers and he sprawled forward upon the table, his head resting upon his arms. Tara of Helium, as the night wore on and Turan did not return, became more and more uneasy, and when dawn broke with no sign of him she guessed that he had failed. Something more than her own unhappy predicament brought a feeling of sorrow to her heart, of sorrow and loneliness. She realized now how she had come to depend upon this panthon, not only for protection, but for companionship as well. She missed him, and in missing him realized suddenly that he had been more to her than a mere hired warrior. It was as though a friend had been taken from her, an old and valued friend. She rose from her place of concealment that she might have a better view of the city. Udor, Dwar of the Eighth Utan of Otar, Jeddak of Manator, rode back in the early dawn toward Manator, from a brief excursion to a neighboring village. As he was rounding the hills south of the city, his keen eyes were attracted by a slight movement among the shrubbery close to the summit of the nearest hill. He halted his vicious mount and watched more closely. He saw a figure rise, facing away from him, and peered down toward Manator beyond the hill. Come, he signaled to his followers, and with a word to his thoat turned the beast at a rapid gallop up the hillside. In his wake swept twenty savage warriors, the padded feet of their mounts soundless upon the soft turf. It was the rattle of sidearms at harness that brought Tara of Helium suddenly about, facing them. She saw a score of warriors, with couched lances bearing down upon her, she glanced at Ghek. What would the Spider-Man do in this emergency? She saw him crawl to his rykor and attach himself. Then he arose, 
the beautiful body once again animated and alert. She thought that the creature was preparing for flight. Well, it made little difference to her. Against such as were streaming up the hill toward them, a single mediocre swordsman such as Ghek was worse than no defense at all. Hurry, Ghek, she admonished him. Back into the hills. You may find there a hiding place. But the creature only stepped between her and the oncoming riders, drawing his long sword. It is useless, Ghek, she said, when she saw that he intended to defend her. What can a single sword accomplish against such odds? I can die but once, replied the Kaldane. You and your panthon saved me from Lud, and I but do what your panthon would do were he here to protect you. It is brave, but it is useless, she replied. Sheath your sword. They may not intend us harm. Ghek let the point of his weapon drop to the ground, but he did not sheath it, and thus the two stood waiting as Udor the Dwar stopped his thoat before them, while his twenty warriors formed a rough circle about. For a long minute Udor sat his mount in silence, looking searchingly first at Tara of Helium and then at her hideous companion. "'What manner of creature are you?' he asked presently. And what do you before the gates of Manator? We are from far countries, replied the girl, and we are lost and starving. We ask only food and rest and the privilege to go our way, seeking our own homes. Udor smiled a grim smile. Manator and the hills which guard it alone know the age of Manator, he said, yet in all the ages that have rolled by since Manator first was, there be no record in the annals of Manator of a stranger departing from Manator. "'But I am a princess,' cried the girl haughtily, "'and my country is not at war with yours. You must give me and my companions aid and assist us to return to our own land. It is the law of Barsoom.' "'Manator knows only the laws of Manator,' replied Udor. "'But come, you shall go with us to the city where you, being beautiful, need have no fear.' I myself will protect you if Otar so decrees. But as for your companion, but hold, you said, companions? There are others of your party, then? You see what you see, replied Tara haughtily. Be that as it may, said Udor, if there be more, they shall not escape Manator, for as I was saying, if your companion fights well, he too may live, for Otar is just, and just are the laws of Manator. Come. Ghek demurred. It is useless, said the girl, seeing that he would have stood his ground and fought them. Let us go with them. Why pit your puny blade against their mighty ones when there should lie in your great brain the means to outwit them? She spoke in a low whisper rapidly. You are right, Tara of Helium, he replied, and sheathed the sword. And so they moved down the hillside toward the gates of Manator. Tara, Princess of Helium, and Ghek, the Kaldane of Bantum, and surrounding them rode the savage painted warriors of Udor, Dwar of the Eighth Utan, of Otar, Jeddak of Manator. This is the end of The Chessmen of Mars, Chapter 10, recording by Tom Weiss.